A third international attempt to evacuate more civilians from Ukraine's besieged Mariupol steel plant is underway. But the UN says no more details will be given about the operation so as not to compromise its possible success. British intelligence says Russian forces are continuing a ground assault on the plant despite promising a ceasefire. The wife of one Ukrainian commander said fighters inside the Azovstal plant had vowed to stand until the end. The battle for Azovstal continues. This video, released by the far-right Azov regiment, shows heavy shelling on Ukraine's last stand in the besieged city of Mariupol. Russia says it is ready for a ceasefire to allow a humanitarian corridor out of the steel plant. But Ukrainian fighters claim otherwise. For the third day in a row, the enemy has broken through the territory of the Azovstal plant, where heavy fighting continues. Once again, the Russians violated the promise of a truce and did not allow the evacuation of civilians who continue to hide from the shelling in the Azovstal plant's basement. Yet. The UN has confirmed that it has successfully evacuated hundreds more from Mariupol during a brief ceasefire on Wednesday. We are accompanied by 11 buses filled of civilians, uh, women, children and elderly who, wants, who are seeking safe haven. Those who have made it out are relieved to finally be safe. But they are also worried about the ones left behind. I don't know who to ask to get them out of there, to get them out of there. If they don't, they will all be killed. There may be hope of a fresh ceasefire holding. A UN convoy on its way to Mariupol is hoping to use this to evacuate more people. And we can cross now to our correspondent in Lviv, Emmanuel Shaz. Emma, it seems Russia has ramped up its assault on the steel plant. Can you tell us more about the situation there right now? Well, indeed, uh, Russia denies that there's a ground fight uh, on the Azovstal steel plant, but British intelligence confirms that uh, this is happening, and Ukrainian armed forces uh, also uh, say that fighting is happening in the Azovstal steel plant, with uh, Ukrainian uh, intelligence officials saying that uh, uh, someone, an electrician, gave away uh, maps of the underground uh, maze of Azovstal to Russian troops, allowing uh, them to know from which uh, part of the plant they could enter uh, this uh, maze. But uh, the uh, forces, the Ukrainian forces currently inside the Azovstal plant, we, uh, it is believed uh, that at least 2,000 soldiers are still uh, holding the positions there. Well, uh, they say they would not uh, surrender with uh, the wife of one of the uh, commander of the uh, Azov battalion, the uh, Azov uh, regiment, which she's uh, also holding its position there, saying uh, that her husband uh, uh, said uh, uh, goodbye and say to her and that uh, they would hold their positions until the very, the very end. So uh, fightings are happening. And of course, this is uh, uh, putting in jeopardy all efforts of a humanitarian evacuation there. Now, a three-day truce was supposed to go into effect on Thursday to allow um, people to get to safety. Are we seeing any evacuations happening right now? Well, uh, it has been a few days that people have indeed been uh, evacuated. Uh, I think uh, by now uh, around 500 people have made it out uh, safely out of uh, uh, Mariupol, not only out of the uh, uh, steel plant, but also uh, out of devastated uh, Mariupol. But there's still uh, hundreds of people who are uh, parked in uh, that uh, steel plant, women, children, elderly people, some in very uh, bad shape, very poor conditions. They've been uh, staying there for more than two months without saying, uh, seeing uh, daylight. And they, too, uh, need, uh, need an out from this situation. There's also, uh, it is believed that hundreds of soldiers are wounded and they are there. Some of them are trapped under rubbles. And uh, uh, the UN said there was an operation underway, but they're not uh, uh, giving away uh, more information uh, so as not to compromise this operation. Emma, President Zelensky has issued a, quite a stark warning that the humanitarian situation, not just in Mariupol, but across all of Ukraine, is growing uh, increasingly dire. Let's take a quick listen to what he said. 
If we take only the medical infrastructure, to date Russians have destroyed or damaged almost 400 health facilities. These are hospitals, maternity wards, outpatient clinics. In the temporarily occupied areas of Ukraine in the east and south, the situation with access to medical services and medicine is just catastrophic. Even the simplest medications are missing. Russia has brought problems to Ukraine and Europe that we could not have imagined a few months ago. Okay, calling it catastrophic. Emma, what more can you tell us about the current situation across the whole of Ukraine? Well, beyond uh, medical facilities being shelled, uh, you can uh, imagine that uh, uh, people uh, from the east uh, would also seek treatment uh, in safety in central or uh, western Ukraine. But facilities are overwhelmed by the amount of people in need of medical uh, treatment. You have to imagine within the country there's over 7.5 million uh, internally displaced people, some of them coming from uh, areas worst affected by the fighting. So here in the the hospital, hospitals are also overwhelmed with uh, uh, war injuries they have to treat here. Added to that, there is, uh, uh, there is regular shelling on uh, infrastructures also uh, in central Ukraine, in western Ukraine. And for example, when a power station, power plant is affected, then it can also affect uh, medical services. So the whole country is left reeling by the Russian aggression. DW correspondent Emma Shaz in Lviv. Thanks so much. Let's take a look now at some of the other developments in the Ukraine conflict. The United Nations World Food Programme is warning of global hunger crises if key Ukrainian ports remain closed. The agency is calling for the reopening of Black Sea harbours, saying they are a key link in global food security. Ukraine is one of the world's leading exporters of grain. An international conference hosted by Poland and Sweden has raised $6.5 billion in pledges to help Ukraine. EU officials, who are also sponsoring the event, say Ukraine needs a new Marshall Plan to help rebuild the country. President Zelensky launched a global fundraising website at the forum saying every donation matters. Israel's Prime Minister says Russia's President Vladimir Putin has apologised for remarks made by his foreign minister who said Adolf Hitler had Jewish blood. Naftali Bennett said Putin made the apology during a phone call. Now, one of Ukraine's biggest victories against the invading Russian forces has been the claimed sinking of the warship Moskva last month. Now, an anonymous US official has told media that Washington shared intelligence with Ukraine about the ship's location. The Moskva was the flagship of Russia's Black Sea fleet. The US says it had no knowledge of Ukraine's plans to attack the Moskva with anti-ship missiles, though reports say it helped pinpoint the Moskva's position. The Biden administration has been ramping up intelligence sharing, as well as shipments of weapons to Ukraine, while avoiding direct conflict with Russia. And for more, we can speak now with Gustav Kresse, senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations and an expert on the Russian military. Welcome to DW. The loss of the Moskva was hugely significant for Russia. How is this news about possible US involvement likely to be going down in Moscow? Uh, well, the fact that the US would share our target data with Ukraine is known since the beginning of March. And it is. It was highly likely at the sinking that U.S. Uh, signal intercepts might have something to do with it, because the Ukrainians don't have sensors that reach so far out into the Black Sea to actually pinpoint and see uh, that there is a warship uh, probably in trouble uh, or distracted by by some cold kind of damage internally. Uh, that would provide a suitable target for uh, their cruise missiles, for their anti-ship missiles. So either the Ukrainians had a electronic intelligence, electronic censoring that uh, caught up the, the signals from that ship and interpreted it on their own, or the most likely and more likely version uh, that uh, the West did, uh, the Americans did, and passed it on to the Ukrainians who, who then uh, got into action.
-hmm. Now, does this kind of assistance from the West increase the risk of Russia escalating its war beyond Ukraine? Um, well, physically, Russia can't. Uh, if you have your army or most of your army bogged down in Ukraine, you just can't afford another war against another country. Uh, and you certainly can't afford another war against uh, the biggest military alliance uh, on the planet right now, which is NATO. So uh, for practical reasons, no. Um, of course, for legal reasons and political reasons, the provision of intelligence is, uh, of course, a, a much more sensitive issue than the provision of arms. A provision of arms for a, a, con a party of war is something that is legal and uh, where you have very clear uh, sort of benchmarks, legal benchmarks, what's allowed, what's not. Uh, on intelligence, things become much more fishy. So these are, of course, inofficial reports. And the US government would, of course, decline having done so for very good reasons. Uh, but uh, inofficially, of course, everybody knows that this is the case. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, it's, it's sort of from the legal side, this is a, a much more fishier part uh, on the whole affair than sending heavy artillery tanks, uh, missiles, etc. To, to the Ukrainians. The, the Kremlin is determined to reach some kind of milestone by May the 9th next week. Now, that's the day that Russia commemorates the Soviet Union's triumph over Nazi Germany. Is Mariupol that victory? And, and do you think Russia will succeed in declaring that a victory? Um, well, it might be. On the other hand, you know, in a country where the foreign minister can come out and say uh, Adolf Hitler was a Jew uh, and Israel is responsible for supporting Nazism, truth doesn't really matter all that much. Uh, they can declare Mariupol as a victory even though there's still fighting going on in the city. Uh, they can declare pretty much anything to a domestic audience because it's punishable up to 15 years to kind of debunk or contradict whatever officially stated to it. So uh, I, I would be rather relaxed about May 9th. Yes, they will announce something. Yes, uh, they will do some propaganda scheme, but that's about to be expected. Uh, I think neither the Russian military nor the Ukrainian military uh, have a, a timeline in their planning offensive and defensive that is tilted towards May 9th. OK, we'll have to leave it there. Gustav Kressel from the European Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now, Ukrainians living under Russian occupation are being faced with a stark choice. Should they resist Russian authority or risk reprisals? Or should they embrace their new leaders? A team from French Public TV recently travelled to one such community in southeastern Ukraine. And what they found were people who, after fighting the invaders just a few weeks ago, are now choosing their words very carefully. Mariupol in southeastern Ukraine. Those who reduced the city to rubble now bring aid. Everything was good and functioning. Now everything is destroyed. Don't talk nonsense. She is only here to provoke. Aren't you here for the aid? What are you talking about? There is tension in the air, but somehow life carries on in the Russian-occupied areas of Ukraine. People are even getting married. Like here in Berdyansk, 80 kilometers from Mariupol. These are the first weddings since the war began. Now the flags are red, white and blue, instead of blue and yellow. It's on show for the world to see. The Russian anthem plays for the wedding ceremony, and the bride and groom beam with joy. It's going well. We are very, very happy. It's an important day for the city and for us. And we are very proud of the country. Of which country, the French journalist asks. Russia. The marriage is marked by celebratory gunfire, while just a few kilometers away, soldiers kill. In occupied areas, Russia has installed mayors who say what Putin wants. 
We have a military and civilian-led administration. We see our future with Russia. This is also being demonstrated in Melitopol. The central square is draped in Soviet colours ahead of the commemoration of the Red Army's victory over Nazi Germany on the 9th of May. Just a few weeks ago, residents protested the occupation. Now, officially at least, there's barely any dissent. I came with the red flag to celebrate Russia's victory. I am not afraid of anything because we have always lived well with Russia. They have raised new flags. Before, it was ours. And there are always soldiers here, not ours. What do you think about that? asks the French TV crew. It's hard to say. We're neutral. Let's put it that way. A new era has begun in the occupied areas of Ukraine. In some places, the ruble is being introduced as, day by day, Russia looks to expand its influence over all areas of life.